Hi, my name is Erin Healy, and we are live with the Young Educators Society of Rhode Island. I think actually maybe we're live now. <laughs> this is my uh, this is my first time using the Facebook Live business feature. Very exciting. Um, so if that didn't work the first time, then hi. Again, my name is Erin Healy, and I am the CEO and founder of the Young Educator Society of Rhode Island. This organization was founded in 2018 to support beginning teachers in Rhode Island as they navigate those years between leaving a teacher preparatory program in college and finding their classroom and, and putting down roots in the education community here in Rhode Island. So and before the pandemic, of course, we work to connect via professional development opportunities. We've had some incredible guest speakers. Um, we've you know, been really fortunate to, to work with so many different education nonprofits around the state and around the country. Um, this, this organization you know, has a lot of foundation in high quality professional resources for new teachers. Um, so we're excited to share some of those with you today. We also connected, again, past tense in person, a lot in social networking opportunities. Uh, one of our favorite ones to do every year was this mid-year conference evaluation prep where we got together workshop, typically Brood Awakenings, and just chatted about mid-year student data collection, professional growth goals, professional responsibilities, etc. Um, and now we're doing it on Facebook. So with that in mind, I hope you guys came prepared with your cup of coffee. I'm really enjoying the, uh, the DIY home coffee latte things that are going on uh, um, on Pinterest in this pandemic. So we're you know, living that life today. So um, I'm uh, to introduce myself a little bit more, actually. I am an English teacher at Cherahoe Regional High School. I have been here for my fourth year at Cherahoe. Uh, I've been teaching ninth and 10th grade English pretty exclusively, I would say, um, for, the last, for the last five years of my career. I founded this in 2018. I, at the same year, I applied and became a FUSE Fellow, so I worked really closely with the Highlander Institute, and I reached out to a couple of my amazing Highlander my, uh, buddies, and we have provided some, again, great opportunities for resources in this event, in this live, um, so I'm very excited about that. But it's a great network. Highly recommend checking out the Highlander Institute. Um, as, and as they do some great work around RI, especially considering supporting teachers in this new hybrid tech digital world that we all live in. Um, and then I am recently, most recently, I am a graduate student at the University of Connecticut. So I am getting my master's degree in educational technology from UConn, very excited about that. And um, this is also a really just a great time to be engaged in the ed tech world a little bit deeper because of all the things that are going on right now. So that's just a little bit about me and kind of where I'm coming from. I'm excited to do this live. I reached out to a lot of amazing teachers for their feedback, their ideas, tips, and tricks. And I'm looking forward to sharing those ideas with you guys during this live. So let's dive in. In Rhode Island, we have a statewide evaluation system run through the Rhode Island Department of Education. Typically, in your first three years, if you remain at the same school, you will be evaluated for those three years, and then you will get a little bit of a break as you become a tenured colleague in your school district. Um, if you change schools during that time, you will need to restart the evaluation cycle. So depending on where you are at joining me on this live, it might be your first year in a new school district, but not your first year, first or second year um, in teaching in life. Or you could be right out of college and going through the evaluation process for the first time this year, in which case, I'm sorry, I do apologize. This year is a lot different than our typical evaluation cycle because, of course, of the pandemic. Um, once you are in a district and you are there for, for three years, if you are marked as highly effective, you get a typically a two-year break. That schedule is a little bit thrown off again because of the pandemic this year. Um, and then after those two years, you will have one more year of evaluations. Same thing, if you are marked as highly effective, you'll get the next two years off. So it's typically a three-year cycle. 
Um, if you are marked as just effective instead of highly effective, you'll have a one year break and then jump back into the cycle again. Um, hopefully continue to improve as, as you exist in your school district. Um, if you are in a charter school, the same evaluation cycle norms apply. If you are marked as developing, then that sparks a chain of events with your administrator, your evaluators, about setting up a cycle for improvement. Um, so again, this is a system that is designed to support teachers to become better, stronger in their profession. It's not, you know, it's not just a, a bunch of hoops for you to jump through, although sometimes it does seem like that. Hopefully today we'll go over some ways to make it seem uh, less time intensive and hopefully, you know, a little bit more useful for the kinds of the kinds of time you're going to be spending on, on submitting some of this paperwork for your evaluations. Um, in, in the evaluation cycle every year, including this year, you have a series of three evaluations and you meet with your evaluator, typically who is your administrator, three times throughout the year. So where we are now is approaching the mid-year conferences. Typically most schools are going to start those at the end of semester one, which is for my school district. and because we're on a statewide calendar, all school districts, it's this week. Um, so after the semester one grades are done and finalized, that's when administrators and evaluators like to pull people in for a quick conference just to touch base on where you're at with not only your professional growth goals and your student learning objectives, but just like how are you navigating the classroom space. These conversations are especially important this year because things are so topsy-turvy and out of the ordinary. It's, it's really helpful to you know, have, these, have this dialogue, have this honest conversation with the leaders of your school and figure out kind of where you fit into that picture given these uncertain learning environments. In the mid-year conference, your evaluator will typically, again, go over your student data. So it's important to have at least an idea of where your, your data points and your grades lie. They'll go over your professional growth goal. So what are you doing to make your profession, make yourself a little bit stronger in your practice? And they'll also probably run through the professional responsibilities rubric with you, which is something we'll get into in a little bit as well as your latest observation scores. Most people by this point have been evaluated definitely once and sometimes, or have observed, sometimes they've been observed once or twice depending on where your school is at this year. I know every school is in a little bit of a different place just because of the crazy learning environments. Um, but if you've been observed twice, you have two sets of data points, sometimes from two different people to go over with your evaluator and make sure that there is no um, something going on that's a little bit different. People are seeing different things depending on what they're looking for in your observation. If you've only had one observation, it's probably been done by your primary evaluator, and in which case you can have a little bit more of a deeper conversation about some of the comments and feedback they've left on your rubric on the Frontline Evaluation app system. Um, that's kind of what the major conference looks like. We're going to go into each of these aspects a little bit deeper, but Thought we're about 10 minutes in, so now's a great time for a giveaway. Uh, so if you are watching live with me, we have these two awesome books from the Dave Burgess Consulting Company, Learn Like a Pirate and Explore Like a Pirate. Um, and if you are watching with me live, please comment on the video with a an emoji on how your day went today to win your these two copies of these fantastic books i have to say the dave burgess consulting company they put out amazing work really excited to offer these two books um they were donated to the sri um they're donated to yesri just to give to some awesome teachers so if you're watching uh with me live come with an emoji uh, an emoji and at the end of the live i will get back to you and with some you know directions on how to get you your copies of the books all right Let's jump into the first and probably the most daunting thing for most teachers, and this is your student data collection. Um, SLOs, or student learning objectives, are formatted based on a, a consistent numerical understanding of where your students lie. This obviously does not paint the full picture of how your students are doing, especially this year. Um, but it is, you know, a very good way to to just 
have a, a blank page, I believe it's quantitative, not qualitative, if I'm getting my cues correct, uh, a, a pretty quantitative, a qualitative approach to looking at where our students getting a marker on the page. Uh, it's black and white, it's clear cut, numbers don't lie, right? So this is an opportunity for your evaluator to see you know, a very quick look at where you are, where your students are, um, and get an understanding about your teaching style based on the student outcomes. Obviously, again, your teaching style is not fully dependent on your student data outcomes, but it's a, it's a, it's a pretty non-biased judgment of where your kids are at. And honestly, we're at the midpoint of a very crazy year. Your students probably aren't going to be at the mark that you set for them in your original student learning objective. This is for a multiple of reasons. We're in a pandemic, right? Students are coming in and out of the health, out of the classroom. They are coming in and out of you know health situations and crises. And your your goals in the beginning of the year might have been pretty lofty, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that your students are there or even close to there at the mid-year conference. When you set your student learning objectives, and obviously you can't go back in time and, and change these necessarily, big asterisk there, because sometimes you are able to do that. Uh, hopefully you gave yourself a little bit of grace while setting these learning goals. Um, instead of having, you know, 80% of your students exceed expectations, while that is lovely in a perfect world, that's not giving you or your students space for flexibility, right? You can set it using words like, you know, the majority of the class will go above and beyond. Maybe reframe it like 80% of the students will meet or exceed expectations. That gives you a bigger window, but you're still working at that, you know, that goal line, right? All students will get to an 80, for example, that's like usually average. Um, passing average, of course. And then if they go above that, fantastic, right? We, our goal is to get everybody above that, but giving yourself a little bit of wiggle room and giving your students a little bit of wiggle room will amount for if a student had a bad day and didn't test well, or, you know, was going through a crisis and couldn't do the proofreading step of their essay, so they got marked down on grammar and that took them below the benchmark that you set for them. Um, giving yourself grace and giving your students grace is going to be something that will not only help you out in your evaluations, but will also help you out in your practice. You'll be, you know, less stressed and intensely focused on that, that very far reaching goal. And you'll be able to, you know, actually engage with the students a little bit more, which is always really helpful. Um, I reached out to one of my awesome friends, Russ, for some of these other tips. And he shared with me that some of the, the greatest things he did for collecting student data were A, setting up Google Sheets well in advance, which is something you might not have done in the beginning of the year, but this is a good time to do it now. You don't need to have your Google Sheets and your color-coded everything's ready for your mid-year conference that goes into your end-of-the-year conference on reflections and data points. But getting some of that data now, putting it into a Google Sheet, just whatever you have, whatever that looks like, is a helpful guidepost for you to understand what kind of conversations you need to have with your evaluator, when you're in your mid-year conference and also kind of help you navigate this next semester and figure out what you need to target specifically like skills or um, types of projects or conversations you need to have with students what you need to focus on as we head into semester two so that is super super helpful now's a great time to do that we're heading into february vacation in a week and a half i know we're all really excited about that so maybe spending a day or two during your february break just getting the Google Forms, Google Sheets set up. It's gonna save you a lot of time, hassle, and energy, and make your conversations much more productive. The second tip that Russ shared was that, yes, you can remove students from your data. Now, it's important to keep a list of what you're doing when you take students out of your data points, but especially this year, uh, when students are disengaged, when students are purposefully refusing to turn in work, they're choosing to remove themselves from the educational experience, or their students were added to your roster late, or your students were taken from your class. All of these circumstances create invalid data points. Now, your evaluation, right, is a study, it's a, it's a scientific experiment, if you will, 
of your teaching practice. So if you wouldn't allow an invalid data point in a research study, why are you allowing it in this evaluation of your personal teaching practice, right? Um, when you you mess with when you incorporate these bad data points into your grade one, like it's you have to have these conversations with principals because they probably know who these kids are already anyway. If they're keeping track of these disengaged learners in your school population right now, um, but one it gives you some fodder to have conversations with your administration team that could be productive, like why is the student disengaged why is the student not coming into school um, but also it gives yourself a little bit more flexibility too like there's not much you can do with a student who wasn't even in the, the school district as a, as a student until a month ago you're not going to go back in time just for this slo that's not good teaching that's just teaching to the slo um, you want to be a good teacher and teach the full student and have them have the full academic experience not just trying to make a check mark and your evaluator is going to know that too it's impossible to evaluate you on a student who wasn't there or a student who is choosing not to be there right um so that's just something not a lot of people know and it's really important for you to advocate for this when you do go into your meeting um this the the students again will probably be known to your administration team um but if you're not advocating for their removal from your data points, not your removal from like your teaching practice, but just they're not going to be considered in your SLOs. Uh, the sooner you can do that, the better. This mid-year conference is a great opportunity to have that conversation with your administrator. Just, you know, this situation is going on. There's not much you can do about it, like for the data, but there's a lot you can do about it with the school leaders, with the parents, with the guidance staff and stuff. And you can start setting up those full, well-rounded supports now as we're halfway through the year, as opposed to waiting until the end of the year to have this conversation about why this student should have been taken off of the data points much earlier in the year. This is when it's helpful. It's not as helpful back then. Um, so if you are watching this and you have a question about some student data, drop the question in the comments. If you're watching this after we're live, obviously I cannot answer your questions in, um, in the moment, but hopefully I'll be able to go back into the comments and help you out if you have any questions about any of the student data stuff later. Uh, I just think the most important takeaway from this student data portion of our live video uh, is that you need to advocate and come prepared. Uh, coming prepared with your Google Sheets set up so you know kind of how to frame your mid-year conversations, but also coming with a, a list of concerns that you can advocate for your data on one conversation and advocate for student support as part of the, as part of the same you know meeting but not necessarily impacting your evaluative scores but student data is only one percentage point of your evaluation score uh, and it's honestly it's about even with your professional responsibilities and your professional growth goals so while this is important it's not the only way you're being evaluated uh, the other way that is is pretty clear cut, but it's sometimes hard to figure out how to incorporate aspects into this is the professional responsibilities part of your evaluation. There's a professional responsibilities rubric that is posted or a handbook um, that is posted in the Rhode Island Department of Ed website, but we have a special freebie for you. So now that we're about 20 minutes in, um, in the Yes R.I. Facebook page, there has just been posted a freebie, which is our professional responsibilities checklist. So we're going to actually dive into that a little bit deeper now, go through some of the responsibilities and examples of what you can provide as evidence for this part of your conversation. Um, but if you want to follow along, go check out our Young Educator Society Facebook page, get your free copy of this checklist open it up on a Google Doc, and you can kind of follow along and jot down your ideas as we go through this. This resource was actually adapted from the one that we use at Cherahoe High School. I think our administration team does a great job with providing a lot of supports around the professional responsibilities rubric. So thank you so much, Cherahoe High School admin, for um, you know, helping us and supporting us through this rubric. But we're going to go into this professional responsibilities now. So the you can go a little bit deeper 
in the Ride Eval Handbook. But let's just go over some of the criteria and examples of evidence, how to upload evidence, and have that prepared for your mid-year conference. When you open up this rubric, you're going to see criteria on the far left-hand side, examples of some evidence you might want to incorporate, and then a space for hyperlinked evidence. Now, the reason I say hyperlinked evidence is because while you do a lot of stuff in your classroom, which is great, and people have probably heard about it, or your admin has gotten like notes from parents or just basic conversations in the hallway, having something hyperlinked, hard data, again, is going to be better. It's going to be more supportive in your favor, and it's just really going to set you up for success in these conferences. It also gives you some hard data points to point to when you're looking for areas of growth or areas of strength. Both are important here, so let's dive in. Professional responsibility one, understanding and participating in school or district-based initiatives and activities. Some of the examples of evidence that you might be able to include are when you participate. Um, well, it's hard to do evidence of like participating in a fire drill, but what I did for mine was I took like a screenshot of the school map and I drew arrows all over it for where my classroom need to go specifically and directions and flow and doors and stuff. And um, having an understanding of that and having hard evidence of that was something I could hyperlink into my professional responsibilities rubric and point to this and saying, you like, yes, I have a very clear understanding and here's how I've applied it to my own physical classroom space. Any work you do with your department or your uh, your grade level team based on you know curriculum assessment, if you have to come up with a new exam, for example, or you're working on redesigning some part of your curriculum, that can go in here. If you attend school events, like you chaperoned the school play, take a picture of the program or like a screenshot of the email saying that you volunteered, throw that in there. Um, a lot of times, your school might have a community service requirement. I know Chair Ho does. Um, so evidence that you did it can go into this section. Um, if you have a picture of yourself from Spirit Day helping out at the pep rally, great. Like some of these things, you just have to think outside the box a little bit. But if you have like a picture or a document or an email, a screenshot, putting those in there is going to be helpful. If you ran a PD for your colleagues, that's blinking that slideshow in there might also be useful. It's good to do these kind of in the moment before you forget, but you have a handy dandy uh, record here as well. Professional responsibilities too. This is maintaining records of communications to uh, stu about student behavior, learning needs, academic process. So having a folder in your school email, that's always really helpful. Having a record of any IEP or 504 meetings you attended, you can screenshot those, go back to your calendar, notifications, etc. Um, keeping a phone or email log is great. It's also super time consuming. If I were you, I would check out some of our resources on the SRI blog. Um, when we did, worked with the RISE group, which I was also kind of part of this summer, uh, we did a whole thing on Formule and setting that up to send automated emails via Google using Google Forms, Google Suite. Setting those up in advance to send frequent communication to parents then you have a good running list right there. It's automated. It's not something added to your plate. It takes a little bit of setup work in the beginning, but once you have it there, that's an automatic log of all the parent communication that you've sent about your students. And Formula is great because it like puts in the student name, puts in the address, like, everything that's on your Google Sheet of grades and, and updates and stuff, it, it plugs it right in. So once you set up the framework, it's really, really easy to use and have that, again, hard evidence to provide for your professional responsibilities rubric. If you do a classroom website, or if you do a, um, a weekly newsletter for your for your parents, right? Incorporate some screenshots of that or responses from your parents. This is gonna be a really great spot to put that as well. All right, professional responsibility three, acting on the belief that all students can learn. While that seems like our job description, here are some of the things you can incorporate for evidence there. Um, any RTI data collection. Any times you've talked to a specialist about a student or anything, take a screenshot of the email, save it somewhere in a folder, put that up here. If you created a graphic organizer or a study guide. These are things that are just commonplace in our practice, right? Because again, it's kind of our job description. Um, but 
they're going to set you up for success in this evaluation because it's showing that you're taking every single aspect of your job seriously and considering it as you know one cohesive unit and while yeah it's great for the evaluations like yes i'm a good teacher and here's the proof um, having hard evidence is going to just help you out and also make your conference a little bit easier for your evaluator who probably has another 30 conferences like this after yours professional responsibility for uh, working towards a safe collaborative culture these are things like do you run a club have you volunteered with a club? Do you go on field trips and you know make sure all that stuff is good? Do you talk to stu students one on one? Do you plan with a TA? Do you go to CPT? Do you plan with your grade level team members? Right? Um, screenshots of that very helpful. Same thing with the um, pressure and responsibility five acting with integrity. Like these things are just stuff you do. Meetings for assessment protocol. Do you proctor the SATs? Um, taking pictures screenshots of all this stuff that's just part of your daily life as soon as you do it stick it on this rubric um the last three four i can count uh, the last four are about lesson planning and data and your professional growth goal which we're going to talk about a little bit in later in this live um, but i just want to point out that this might seem repetitive as you're scrolling through the professional responsibilities rubric again i see a couple new people on the live if you are just joining us there's a freebie that has just been posted to the young educator society facebook page it's got this free copy of the professional responsibilities checklist on there we're just going through that list and seeing if there are any um, pieces of evidence that you might be able to incorporate in your mid-year conference that you didn't think of already um, so again, while some of this seems repetitive, right? Oh, I think I can use, you know, chaperoning the school play for three of these professional responsibilities rubrics. That's great. Like it should be a little bit repetitive because it's all wrapped up in what you consider your normal day-to-day -day responsibilities as a teacher anyway. Um, your, ad your admin just wants to see that you're doing it without having to follow you around all the time. The easier you can make your evaluator's job the probably the better you're going to score on your evaluations. Um, your evaluator might not necessarily say that out loud, but like if you can provide a ton of evidence in something like your professional responsibilities rubric, then they're going to look at that and say like, oh yes, all of these things that they're doing meet all of these benchmarks. And like you're just providing a ton of proof about why you deserve the high score that you deserve. It does require a little bit of thinking outside the box and going back to get records of emails and parent logs and you know, IEP meetings, right? It, it takes some time, but in the end, you're going to have so much evidence about why you deserve the top score that that's going to be the score you're going to end up with, right? Um, so again, professional responsibilities rubric, it's our freebie posted over on our Facebook page. Go check that out. Okay, now what do you do with this once you've put all your hyperlinked evidence and you've overwhelmed your evaluator with all of your awesomeness? One, you can look for areas of growth. These are when you just do a, literally a visual scan down your professional responsibilities rubric and you go, what box doesn't have a ton of stuff in it? We're at the halfway point this year. You might not have done a lot of stuff because you might not be in your, in your physical classroom building yet. Um, and that's fine. Right? Everyone's being flexible, everyone's learning a little bit differently this year, and that's totally okay. So use this checklist as literally a visual scan to work with your evaluator on figuring out any areas for growth. Then you have from now until May, June, whenever your end of the year evaluation is, to go back and show them how you, how you like boosted those different areas of the criteria right? Um, it gives you very specific things to focus on too. So you're not just like signing up for every professional development workshop and you're not always just like extending yourself here, there and everywhere. It gives you some more focus. And so you can use your time a little bit more wisely as we end the school year. The second great reason to why you should have this all filled out for your mid-year conference is so you can find areas of strength. Now, if you're a new teacher, like brand new, right out of college, this could be a little bit intimidating, but it's also really, really valuable. So let's go into this. One of the ways you can score a four on your, or the top score on your professional responsibilities rubric is if you are sharing 
the knowledge that you've learned through your professional growth goal or through any of the professional development you've been doing with others. So that could be your department, that could be your CPT, that could be your grade level team, right? Um, finding areas of strength, something that you do really well, like I learned for Mule, and I'm going to share that with my department so we can keep um, automated emails to all of our families. That's great. Tell them about it. Write down or take a screenshot of the calendar invite that you set up for your weekly um, grade level team meeting and put that in your checklist, right? This is this is all furthering evidence, but it's it's showing where you're taking areas of strength and continuing to build up and support the people around you, which is what your admin really wants to see, right? Your evaluation is not just to make you a better teacher, but it's also to make your school a better teaching community and to support all the educators around you and in your building um, by making you a better teacher or by supporting you through your evaluation to become a better teacher your evaluator is really hopefully supporting and promoting the growth and the professional drive of all of their staff right this is something that they're going to have to do with all of the people in their building and if you are willing to share some of the stuff that you've learned um, it helps you out for professional responsibility criteria number six, and it supports other teachers around the building, which is which is ideal. Um, so this checklist, again, you can go find it as a freebie. Um, that's available for you guys as a Google Doc, and um, that's the professional responsibilities piece of your evaluation cycle. So again, we've covered student data collection tips and tricks for that. We've covered professional responsibilities. These are just two parts out of four that you're evaluated on in the evaluation cycle. Let's go on to professional growth and development. Uh, your PGG has already been written. Great. I hope that is going so well for you guys. Um, I know it's really hard to be working towards a PGG in a time where everything is so uncertain and, and up in the air. So I gave you a lot of credit for identifying an area of growth that's not just like figure out how to survive teaching in a pandemic and working towards that. Um, I know it's really hard for everybody to be teaching right now and you've identified an area of growth for your practice and are working towards that above and beyond what has been going on in our buildings across the state already. So I'm really, really excited and hopefully your PGG is something you want to work on. Um, three minutes ago now, a little bit behind my schedule. On the YesRI Facebook page was posted a blog link to the Teach Better blog. Um, there's a Begin Better series that I'm, I'm working on with the Teach Better team. And our most recent blog was actually on keeping your practice current and finding professional development and strategies um, in a pandemic and not in a pandemic. How you can grow professionally and in ways that are both free and paid. They're all, there's a lot of really cool links on the blog, but I kind of want to dive into a couple of those. Your PGG ideally was something that was relevant to your content and topic area. If it wasn't, if you were kind of like roped into using a department or building-wide professional growth goal, that's not super ideal. Um, just because if it's not benefiting your practice, it's going to feel like a lot of heavy lifting for not a lot of reward. Um, no one's forcing you to use a school or department level professional growth goal. If so, if you want to change it, talk with your administrator. Like this doesn't seem to be fitting me and my practice. I'd like to spin it in this way to be more relevant. And having that conversation with your evaluator now might be a really good idea to make sure that you're spending the next couple of months working towards something that actually benefits you and your practice. Um, but if you open up the the resource that's just been thrown over on the YesRI Facebook page, uh, you'll see there's a couple different options there. So in terms of free professional development, these are things like engaging on social media, in Twitter chats, or um, in listening to podcasts, checking out webinars. There's a lot of stuff that's been going on now because of the pandemic that is free and that is super informational, informative, super informative um, for teachers that's it's super affordable. Um, oh, blogs, YouTube channels, right? These are some ways that if you show proof that you watched them or participated or engaged in them, like a Twitter chat, um, that is proof that you're working towards your professional growth goal in an area that's relevant and helpful for you in your practice. Um, 
some of the paid ones that you have very obvious proof that you did or attended, you probably have a a, um, a PLU certificate, right? Um, if it's one of these ride programs from their um, the professional learning network, they do those courses on an almost weekly basis. They're free for teachers. Um, some of them might have a little bit of a cost, but they're going to give you a certificate that you can easily scan and put the scan in your professional responsibilities rubric or as proof of your PGG. Um, if you have a membership in a professional organization, say you wanted to work towards a goal, uh, you are a music teacher, and you wanted to work towards a goal that's very specific to your content of music education, attending a NAFME or RIMIA workshop right? Uh, something that's targeted towards your content area will be more of a benefit, more of a benefit to your practice than, for example, attending a, um, a generic, like, academic planning workshop. Um, and once you have a piece of paper that confirms your membership in something like Third Island Music Educators Association, right, and you have a piece of paper that says, yes, I, I paid for this and I attended this workshop, um, that's something that you can put towards your professional growth goal as well. If you were able to attend a virtual conference, there have been a couple of really cool virtual conferences like ISTE's Turned Virtual, um, the International Society of Technology Educators. And there's a couple of, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the acronym for the other virtual conference, but there's a bunch that are popping up as people become more familiar with using Zoom and, and using these conferencing tools online. If you attended a virtual conference, they'll also send you a certificate, and that is proof that you have attended something that is working towards that professional growth goal, so you have participated in some sort of learning. Um, finally, the last thing that I also wanted to highlight from that resource that I posted on the SRI Facebook page is that um, idea of grad courses. If your professional development or your professional growth goal was related to something that you want to dive a little deeper in, like learn something about Shakespeare's life to redo your Romeo and Juliet unit, very, very content specific. If you're interested in taking a graduate course, a lot of courses are being offered online. You can do a either a whole degree, very cost prohibitive, or you can enroll as a non-continuing, I believe is the term, student and just take one grad class. It's not going to be like working towards a degree or anything, but it will be proof, it'll have a lot of evidence from that that you've spent a very lengthy amount of time working towards a very specific content area goal. So those are some of the ways that I, I found have been really helpful in the pandemic to work towards a professional growth goal and get some more professional development. Um, that, that post is, again, geared towards PD in general, but it can be really helpful for your professional growth goal because it does provide hard evidence that you did something working towards your goal. Um, Again, making sure that your PGD is relevant, if there's a way you can spin it, like if you took one of the CANS department or building-wide PGGs, work with your evaluator in your conference to have a conversation about it. Now, this is a great time to pause and say that I keep saying have a conversation about it, which is a lot easier said than done, right? If you're a new teacher, you're like, I have to sit with my principal and have a 15 minute conversation. I'm so nervous. Like, I, I'm there, I, I feel you guys, I was, I was there for the last, four years of my teaching career, right? Um, but having these conversations, especially this year, is going to give you a lot of insight into what exactly your school is looking for to not only benefit your practice, but benefit the entire learning community as a whole. Um, so having honest dialogue is going to be a lot more informative and help you frame your goals in a, in a much more efficient manner than just walking in there saying, here's my data, goodbye. Which again, is something that I've done in the past, so this is why we're hosting the live. So hopefully you guys don't do this when you head into your mid-year conferences. Um, if you have any questions about the professional growth goal or about some professional development opportunities, please drop a question in the comments, either as we are now live or afterwards and I can come check back in with you a little bit later. This is a great time for another giveaway. So this is our second giveaway of the day. Um, if you were watching earlier and you commented with an emoji about how your day went, you might have won a book. 
Now we're giving away one of these awesome Yes R.I. t-shirts. Get Yes R.I. in the front. And then we teach to change the future. A nice anchor image on the back. If you want to be the lucky recipient of one of our Yes R.I. t-shirts, I need you to share in the comments a uh, the moment the moment you knew you wanted to be a teacher what's your why when did you figure out your why share it in the comments and you can win a t-shirt um i'll be in touch with the t-shirt mailing size information after the live is over um so if you're interested in that giveaway comment above comment below Let's move into our final and probably the lengthiest conversation of your teacher evaluations. This is your observations. So hopefully again, by now you've definitely been observed once, maybe even twice. This mid-year conference is going to be a great time to have a conversation with your evaluator about some of the comments that they wrote into the teaching, the observation rubric, and also kind of just figure out what their goals are for your final two or three observations of your year couple of great goal um, ideas were submitted actually when I reached out to my amazing network um, and I just want to share them with you really quick. When you're getting evaluated, you have a two week, I believe it is, window. They should be informing you like in these two weeks, I'm going to be coming in to observe you. And then you can prepare. And I know it's hard to plan in a pandemic, but try your best. Uh, it's really helpful to actually go back to college get some of those unit or lesson plan templates that you submitted and actually rework those for your current practice. Um, something that has helped out a couple different people that I reached out to was sharing the overall unit plan with your evaluator when you knew they were about to come in if they had a couple of weeks of a window. Um, if you share your unit plan with them or your lesson plans for the week, right? They'll have an idea about the continuity of your lesson and it'll also prevent them from coming in at an inopportune moment. For example, during exam prep or when you're giving a quiz, right? Um, it'll allow you and your evaluator to come in with a, to come into this experience of being observed with a, you know, A, proactive approach, and B, a better understanding of where the students should be and where you want them to be at the end of this time period when they're coming in to evaluate. Because everything is on technology now, because teaching via virtual teaching practices is the most equitable way to teach in a hybrid teaching situation, you have to teach to the lowest common denominator, and that is the kid who's by themselves at home. Making sure that everything is accessible to all of your students means it has to be done virtually. So that relies heavily on technology. And it's really going to be important to try and do a test run with your technology in advance of actually teaching the lesson. Um, if you can possibly give us a couple sections or classes of the same group, try running the lesson the day before, in the morning, um, practice with the technology, don't incorporate anything new. If you've never used Padlet in your classes, the day your principal walks in is probably not the time you want to try out Padlet, right? And if you're doing something new or shiny, like A, it might not have good academic content for your kids. And B, your principal is definitely going to know that you're trying something new because they're showing up in the room. The chances of it not working are a lot higher. That's not great. But also, your kids are very obvious purveyors of emotion, right? So if you're trying something new because the principal's there for the first time and they've never done it or it's weird to them, either they're going to make a comment about it directly or they're going to just indirectly show through facial expressions, body language, class questions that they don't understand what's going on. They don't necessarily see the value in it. You really want to make sure that what you're doing with your, uh, with your observer is something that you would normally do with your kids when you're not getting observed. And that kind of confidence, that practice, that relaxed teaching style will actually show more to your evaluator than you might think. They want to see things like, do you have a relationship with the students? Do you have a rapport with the students, right? If you're trying something out of the box, you're gonna be a lot more nervous. That's going to show through your teaching and it's gonna show with your kids as well. So ideally, like you do something you would normally do, do a test run, 
test out the technology in advance too, right? Um, and then you'll be able to flow a lot easier and, and act more confident in your observation. I like to say, fake it till you make it. Because again, if you're showing the confidence, you might not actually feel inside. Your students will react better. Your observer will react better. It's just going to be a more well-rounded experience for you. Additionally, if you're doing something you normally do, you'll actually be able to get really good feedback on your everyday teaching practice. Um, I'm not necessarily a proponent of don't prepare for your observer to come in, um, because as somebody who has done that in the past, and I apologize to my department chair again, um, if you just do something you would normally do in the class and you don't actually prepare, like, it might not go well. And you're, it might, it'll also be a, an opportunity for your evaluator to say, like, if this is something you're doing in a normal class, here are some ways you have to change this. Um, that dialogue is important. So, like, practice it, do something you would normally do, um, but still prepare in advance to just have these kinds of conversations and try and look at your lesson from all different angles. It's just going to work out better in the long run. And again, having the conversation, really valuable, but you want it to be something that's actually meaningful to you. If you're getting a conversation about something you'll never do again, it's not a valuable conversation. It's kind of a waste of yours and your observer's time. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with observations is that you should definitely be assertive. And assertive is a very good positive adjective, even though it's not always used that way. Um, if you know that there are issues going on in your classroom that day, or um, there's, th there's things going on that your evaluator might not just know if I'm stepping into your room for 20 minutes, you have to tell them. Um, you know, look at the timelines. If that doesn't work for you, if you're if these two weeks like you're testing, you have star tests coming in, you have the SATs or anything, if the timeline doesn't work, just tell them. Your administrator is going to respect you more for, for telling them about this stuff than if you just, if it's surprised on them the day of your observation. Um, if you invite them for a couple of different kind of practice observations or you continuously share information with them, that kind of assertiveness too, that's going to help you out with your observer as they understand more of like long term what you're doing. And it also helps you be a little bit more comfortable with them popping into your Google Meet, right? And then finally, when I talk about assertion, I mean, if something's going on in your class, like, for example, one of my friends, my parents, Karen, shared the story with me that I really appreciate her sharing with me. Um, this, there was one person in, in school. Everyone else was on Google. Nobody had done the work per, to prepare for the day. All of a sudden, lesson plan was thrown out the window. But then, unannounced observation. What do you do? You have to, you have to go and you have to advocate for yourself with your administrator and say, you know, this is this is what happened. This is not a reflection of my teaching practice because I couldn't get to teach. My students didn't come to class prepared. That kind of advocacy is really really hard for a new teacher. It's really scary, but it's really important too. They're not going to understand how you are as a teacher if you're not able to teach on the day they come to observe. So being assertive in the moment, advocating for yourself, advocating for your students. Um, that's going to provide a more fair observation, which is critical as we're teaching in the middle of a pandemic. So those are just some things to keep in mind in your observation. Following up after the observation, trying to hear from them, have a quick conversation, touch base about the observation in person is also super helpful. Um, not just waiting for the written feedback to come in, because then, you know, you could take different nuances from the text that they might not or they might share with you differently in person, so it comes across a little bit better. It gives you quick turnaround feedback to prepare if you have to change your lesson up for the next day or the next week too. Um, so this is super helpful. So just following up with your evaluator very, very quickly after you observe is gonna be important. In your mid-year conference, talk about those evaluation scores. Talk about that evaluative feedback um, from your observations with your principal or your, your primary evaluator. Um, it shows that you've gone, taken the time to read their comments, change some things in your lesson. Maybe you found that their suggestions didn't work. And again, be assertive, be honest about that. You want to have an authentic relationship with your evaluator, um, and that's going to show through your conversations with them. 
All right, we have about 10 more minutes of this live scheduled. So I just want to kind of talk about some broader picture things to do with evaluations. And again, if you have any questions about any of the stuff while we're talking, please feel free to drop it in the comments below. If you're commenting later after the live, that's great. I'll follow up with you after the live is over. Okay, we're in a pandemic this year. I've talked about that a couple times. It requires a lot more coffee, I think, than uh, most teaching years, right? Everything is harder, but it's not just harder for you. It's harder for your students and it's harder for your evaluator. Um, having the grace and the patience to be flexible with yourself, with your students, and with your evaluator is going to be really important. And being honest as you communicate that flexibility and that grace with your evaluator is going to, A, show your evaluator that you really are understanding that the climate that we're teaching in right now and, and doing your best to grow through that for you and your students. Um, and B, it'll allow them to look at your evaluations and your, your scores with such grace and flexibility because you've been honest and open with them the whole time. So that's really important. Um, teaching in a hybrid environment is really hard. I actually wanted to share a, a quick story from my friend Julie. She's an elementary PE teacher. Um, she, one of her evaluations was like relying on you know technology but she had took the taken the students out for the day but again we're in a pandemic technology is really important um if if the things that they're looking for aren't being seen because your unit for today involved your kids at home doing asynchronous learning and your kids in school doing synchronous learning um just be honest and say like you know today is the situation like this because of a certain reason just telling them those reasons up front is going to be really really important um, also, Julie shared another tidbit, which I did not realize was an issue. Um, one of her evaluators complimented her on calling on all genders equally. So if, especially if you're in elementary school, that is something that evaluators are looking for. I did not know that was a thing. And I highly wanted to, like, to recommend to you to just be cognizant of how you are interacting with different members of your class because your observers, your evaluators definitely are keeping track of that, especially in this climate. So that's another a, a recent 2020-2021 um, evaluative tip that, again, didn't think we needed to share, but keep it in mind. Who knew? And the other thing that I wanted to point out is not necessarily related to the pandemic, but just general conversations about evaluations. This evaluative system applies to public schools and charter schools in Rhode Island equally. The thing that's a little bit different about charter versus public is that you might not know your evaluator, your evaluator's style, because administration has more, or like evaluators have more turnover in a charter system. Uh, just because you might have been evaluated by somebody last year does not mean that you'll be evaluated by the same person next year. So this, again, goes back to my point on having conversations, being authentic, being open and being honest with your evaluator throughout the entire process, especially if you're, if you're, you know, have a new evaluator or maybe new to you, like you changed schools this year. These conversations will kind of show you what lens they're looking for, what their goals are for the school, what their goals are for you. And you can frame your observations, you can frame your data, you can frame these conversations in a way that reflects their goals while also promoting your goals and what you know is best for your students. Um, just It does help you kind of adjust your practice or like reframe it, not even change it up because we're not doing a dog and pony show, right? We're trying to get actionable feedback to make our teaching practice better. Just call it an evaluation, but it's actually just super important for our teaching practices. But maybe the way you frame it might look different depending on who's evaluating you. So that's just a quick note. Um, thank you to my friend Nick. Again, I have a great support network for this um, this live. So I just you know, want to show these things. Couple more awesome ideas for thinking inside the box in this evaluation cycle. We have five minutes left of this live. Uh, my friend Lisa from Newport, from Rogers High School, she is actually the math department chair. And so when I reached out to her, I was thinking like, what do you look for in supporting newer teachers through this evaluation process? And she has something really interesting to share actually. She talked about how she was looking for newer teachers 
um, how they collaborated and how they learned from and with other colleagues in their department. This kind of goes back to what we're talking about with the professional responsibilities rubric. PR6 actually is engaging with your colleagues in professional development exercises, right? Um, she's looking for how teachers learn from others and share with others. And that to her is really indicative of the, you know, the learning community trying to be built in the school. And that's something your evaluator is going to be looking for too. While she's not directly involved in the evaluative process, your admin, your you know, your assistant principal, right, whoever's doing the evaluation is probably also looking to see how you're contributing to the school community in a positive way as they invest their time and energy and feedback into making you a better teacher. Again, you want to be a better teacher, they want you to be a better teacher, they also want their school community to be surrounded and supported by high quality educators and that's that's really the point of this evaluation cycle as much as it seems like it's just hoops to jump through. Um, so we have three more minutes left of this live. I just wanted to, to say best of luck if you are getting evaluated this year. I hope this live was really helpful, um, just kind of wrapping your mind around what it means to be evaluated in a pandemic. If you weren't being evaluated this year, I hope this live kind of gives you some perspectives as we jump ahead and we think about next year and future years and teaching and kind of where that's going. Super fun giveaway posted on the SRI Facebook page is actually our free guide to, um, I called it hashtag write those SLOs and MPGGs. And it's a really, really great step-by-step -step guide. It's free. It's on a Google Doc. The link will make you make your own copy of it walks you through kind of what to think about as you brainstorm for SLOs and PGGs in the future and kind of how to reframe some of these ideas about student data collection and professional responsibilities and it's all linked in the Facebook page for you free. I hope you guys enjoy it. Popular being brought back by, um, by a lot of requests via email so <laughs> I'm putting it on the Facebook page again. But I really hope you take that guide and you're able to use that to either you know set up or support your your evaluation stuff for next year or even look at some of the ideas that are thrown around in that in that guidebook and maybe you want to kind of reframe and edit some of these goals you've set for yourself this year the mid-year conference is the best time to do that and as long as you're willing to have that authentic conversation with your evaluator so if you have any questions I hopefully have answered some of them for you. If you continue to have questions, just drop them in the comments of this video. I know the live is almost done, but I will definitely check back in on the comments as this video gets, gets published on our Facebook page, and I can definitely follow up with you. If you, um, if you were the winners of our awesome giveaway books, then you have commented an emoji about how your day went today. That's cool. If you wanted to win a t-shirt, you've commented with when you figured out your why for becoming a teacher. And to close off, we have one last giveaway. Uh, we have a Barrington Books gift card kindly donated by the small local business. And to win this Barrington Books gift card in live, you just have to... Um, it's a drop in with your evaluations and coffee. So drop in your favorite coffee order and you're gonna get a Barrington Books gift card. And I'll be touched after this live to get mailing information. Um, but if you are watching and you wanna comment, favorite copy, this book gift card is yours. It's a beautiful store, so lots of things besides books, but I'm an English teacher, as I mentioned in the beginning, so I have to go with the books. Thank you so much to my amazing support team who came together with all these awesome ideas and information that I've shared with you in this live. Thank you to Lisa. Uh, Lisa Canole at Rogers, Jason Appel and Sam Schachter from Barrington High School, Karen Lockhart from East Granite, Julie uh, Marin from Cranston, Cranston Elementary, Alyssa Hurley from Ponagansett, Russell Vendito from Cherho, Nick Hurley from Blackstone Valley Prep, and Amanda Davia from Narragansett High School. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. I am super grateful for you guys. I hope that this live was super helpful. And if you continue to have questions, drop us a comment below. Please follow the Young Educator Society. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at YesRIOrg. Uh, you can find us on all the social medias. We have an incredibly active blog and website. 
all the information is in the Facebook bio. Have a fantastic rest of your day, enjoy your coffee, and good luck in your evaluations this year.